Welcome to our inaugural podcast. Steve Medeo with yours truly. I'm Jimmy Fitz. Thanks for joining us. In this series of podcasts, we're going to take you on an incredible journey. You're going to find out how it felt to be performing on stage at Woodstock with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. We're going to take you into recording sessions with the most iconic artists on the planet. We're going to talk about the personalities of the people behind the music. We'll find out what it was like to collaborate, record Grammy-winning music, and tour with Stevie Wonder. What it was like to write killer arrangements, recording with Earth, Wind, and Fire. We'll go into the mind of John Lennon with Steve Medeo as he recounts his sessions with John on the Walls and Bridges album. We'll find out what it was like to tour with the Rolling Stones and to hang out with Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. And we'll continue through his amazing career as he did countless sessions with artists like Eric Clapton, Neil Diamond, Barbara Streisand, Madonna, James Taylor, Joe Cocker, the Marshall Tucker Band, all the way to Maroon 5 and too many more to even mention. Steve Medeo. Steve's new book, Reflections in the Key of Life. Steve Medeo, trumpet master and longtime musical savant who has played with so many different acts who you are very well aware of, closely associated with Stevie Wonder. You can't hear a Stevie Wonder hit with horns without hearing Steve Medeo. Steve, what's happening, buddy? How you doing, Fitz? Good I'm, morning. I, I think this is so exciting that we're doing this podcast, which is basically a way to expand on your book and go into more detail on the amazing background and career that you You've had. What's pretty interesting is that after reflecting back and, and sort of looking at what's written in the book, I realized that there's a lot of elements, <laughs> a little elements not there because everybody keeps on saying, well, what about this story and what about that story? So it's kind of fun because it's been great to really reflect back on this whole thing. I, I realize I've been very lucky, very fortunate, and I'm very grateful for that. It's got to be really interesting to stop and reflect with all the miles that you've covered, all the artists that you've toured with, all the artists you've recorded with, and to uh, take a pause because it's not like you've quit. You're still churning and burning big time, probably more than you have uh, in the last several years. And yet to stop, take a beat, and look back has got to be almost heartwarming and scary at the same time. Well, it's, I don't know if frightening is the right word because, I mean, I have a thing of fear. I don't really have fear a lot of the ways. But I will tell you what, it's it's almost surreal because it's almost like uh, you, you don't really understand that part of your life. Every part of it is different. You have so many different parts of your life when you're young, and it keep, but it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. It just keeps on going as it's proving now. And in this book, you also, uh, this is not just a, I played with who and I toured here and, and, and toured there. There's some great life journey lessons along the way that you impart and some really good, deep, deep stuff in this book that talks about the choices you may make or not make that can affect the whole rest of your life, not just as a musician, just as a human being. As a human being, good and bad. You know, what, what I realized as I went along, the book, although my vehicle is music and, and trumpet and, and producing and, and arranging, it has nothing to do with music. It has to do with the choices. It's applicable if you're a lawyer, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a cab driver, if you're a plumber. It doesn't matter. It's the choices you make and whether you sit and watch all the buses go by or you decide to take the chance to get on the bus. And if it doesn't work, you get off the bus. But you, you, it's not going to just come and drive out of the sky. It's not going to happen. That's the hit. No, you have to be proactive. Those opportunities, sometimes you only get one shot. And if you don't take advantage of it, hey, hey, look, just as, 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 a, as a quick teaser, which you know the story, about four years ago, and I had started this situation with a book with uh, Tad Sisler, and we had talked about it, and we started off as a documentary, and it grew from there. But I made a call to Europe for some pictures from period of 1976 to 1983 or 84. And out of that call to a, a good friend of mine, Veronique Sasson, who was originally married to uh, one of the people she was married to was Stephen Stills, who I had known from Woodstock days. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how all the ties work out. But sure. I called for pictures. And out of the call for pictures, she says, you know, by the way, I'm doing this thing of the American years, which you did all these records with me, and you arranged them with me, and you empowered me as a young person. We've known each other 40 years years now so we were little kids together mm. and she said would you be interested in doing this and I said let me ask you a question if money wasn't the element would you want to use me she says that, that's not in question so I spoke to the business people and worked out something because it was not the point of me proving who I was but rather supporting her and giving the agenda being her not me that's four years ago now I've been back and forth to Europe in Paris, based in Paris. For Touring four years. with her. How long had it been since you had talked with her before you made this phone call? Maybe, uh, I, I spoke to her briefly about two years ago. She had went through some rehab. But before that, maybe five years, six years. Mm. But 
when you're friends with someone, you don't need to talk all the time. Sometimes it's just of it's sending a little message with a flower, no just doubt. to know that the thought is there. That's all it is. You had a musical history with her, but you weren't necessarily on her radar big time. Being over here and her being in France, if you didn't make that call, odds are you wouldn't be touring right. with her as you have been the last. No, I have been. Now here's the catch to the whole thing, which I just find out. I go back, I guess, in on on the end of June. So the first thing we're doing is a festival. Now, when I was back there this last trip, she's doing an album, which she did a, a duo album on Sony Records. So I'd go and do the album, and I'm playing, and we do all the things, blah, blah, blah. And I just leave it, and I don't think about it, as I've done my whole life. Well, I find out on the show now, who's on the show with her is Stephen Stills on this festival, because he's got the album on Sony coming out with who? Judy, Judy Collins. Judy Collins. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it's unbelievable That's how crazy. this whole thing has turned into this other thing now. That's pretty wild. Pretty, it's, why, it's wild. Well, Steve, you, I mean, you, uh, you and I have a little joke whenever you've been in the uh, radio studio with me and we're playing music and uh, I tell everyone, it's not who has Steve Medeo played with, it's who hasn't he played with. Can we just do a top of mind, go down the list as to all the people you have toured and recorded with? Okay. Give me, uh, give me the broad stroke. I'll give you, I'll give you, it actually uh, started off in the jazz with Sun Ra. Sun Ra was into avant-garde jazz, bebop, and jazz fusion. He was always stretching the limits. Then it was with the Beach Boys. On the Beach Boys tour, I wound up hanging out with the bad boy, of course, Dennis Wilson. In your book, you go into more detail on that. The Beach Boys in the 60s. Then it was with Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Butterfield Blues Band, which I proceeded with all the Fillmore dates, and that was managed by Albert Grossman. You played Woodstock? I played Woodstock with Butterfield. Albert Grossman at the time managed Dylan, Janis Joplin, Chris Christopherson, Butterfield. So every time I'd go up to the office, all these people were around. They were all friends of ours. I had a house down the street from Dylan and the Pink House with the band. When I left Butterfield after Woodstock, I was doing work in the studio with B.B. King, Thrill is Gone. That was my first big record I ever did wow. as a kid. And they called me at 10 o'clock at night because everybody else was tired after being there all day. And so I created enemies to begin with as a, <laughs> as a little 17-year-old kid coming into the studio fresh. Wow. And they were there all day. Thrill! Then it was with Stevie Wonder, so I did Superstition with Trevor Lawrence, myself, and Stevie, the only three people on that record. Keep me Continue with him off and on for four years with Stevie Wonder through uh, Songs in the Key of Life, 
which was, the, to me, was some of the greatest combination of his life, of his writing, that four years between talking book, fulfilling this and everything mm -hmm. else. Did the Stones at the same time. Left Stevie to do the Stones for a couple of tours. Meanwhile, working in the studio with Earth, Wind & Fire. I did September with Earth, Wind & Fire, who I had originally met back in the Fillmore days. They were the opening up act with Butterfield on, the, on some of those shows. So it's kind of unbelievable that I knew Maurice White and all those people back from then. time September comes on, I think about these guys. Very, very inventive at the time. A lot of people copied him afterwards, but they were the original guys, really. I did Like a Prayer with Madonna. But Everybody says Madonna was a pain in the ass. She's a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. I find nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I enjoy women who understand what they want and ask for it, and not afraid to empower themselves to ask for it. Madonna's always known who, pretty much who she is and yeah, what she Yeah, I mean, she, she knows what she do. wants. Right, exactly. Bonnie Raitt, I knew her. Her father was a trumpet player. She liked trumpet players. My friends were in the band. I didn't know her dad was a trumpet yeah, player. Yeah, he was a big, uh, a Broadway star. Right, he was an actor. I didn't an know An actor, he, but he was a trumpet player. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was a Broadway star. Wow. So she had an affinity for trumpet players. So we sure. always got along. It was kind of cool. When I did the Glow album with Bonnie Raitt, we collaborated at Capitol Records. Bonnie told me, I love the sound of the trumpet. She had grown up hearing her father play trumpet just like I had. But I about to come to an end and all these people that i met at the, the fillmore days with bill graham so that was good networking for you uh, yeah but you know i was a party guy so i never thought anybody looked at me or knew what i was doing i was very wrong i should should have been a little more cautious about my life <laughs> at that point but but i think uh, it's better i did it then to be honest with you because if if i if i try to do it now i'd be dead in two days you know remember i used to hang with keith mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm i'm life in the carpool now but, <laughs> and i've been sober for 27 years so i've been lucky you told me the story about how uh, you were working with stevie wonder and were very ingrained in that in that whole uh, time period with stevie and 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 his touring and recording, but the Rolling Stones wanted to lure you. Can you share that story a little yeah, bit with well, us? Well, the, the year before, Stevie had opened up for the Stones, and Stevie didn't want to do it, and myself, Sam Bourne was with him, Trevor Lawrence, Buzzy Featon, and we said, look, your audience is mostly a African-American audience. We just came from an audience that's mostly white college kids. Uh, this might be to your advantage to do the Stones, which is a white audience. And the money wasn't very good for him, but he decided to do it. His, his business people didn't want him to do it. So during that tour, I hung out with the Stones a lot. They said, come on the plane. Keith says, come on the plane with us. So I'm traveling on the plane with them, which is better than the bus with Stevie. <laughs> it was kind of cool. So about a year later, they were getting ready to do a European tour. So I get a call from Keith, and I was at the Fifth Avenue Hotel Rehearsal with Stevie. And he says, we want to come down and talk to you. I says, well, I'm at the bar. Come on down. And I was sitting there drinking black Russians. And Keith and Mick come by. And Keith comes in, and he says, mix outside, we want to talk to you. And they had a Dame limousine. And it was the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York where I lived. And I went out there, and uh, he says, look, we're doing a tour, a 10-week tour, and we want you to do this tour with us. And I says, oh, I don't know, I don't, I'm not really into this. I said, you guys play three chords. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I actually said. You know, I said, I like Steve. You know, he got all this musical stuff going on. It's really good for the ear. It's really musical. And they're laughing. And I'm saying, well, we want you to do this tour. And I'm saying, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm really not into it. I'm looking up at the sky with my eyeballs, you know. It's the old routine, like when, you, when you're drinking and you're drunk, you know. And I said, well, what would it take? And I gave them a figure, which was 
unbelievable, which would be unbelievable now, and especially not for a trouble player, for anybody. And they said, okay. And like in a nanosecond, I said, and I want half the money up front in case you die in the middle of the tour. Oh, oh, oh thanks a lot. <laughs> now, now I took the gig. Now I got to go tell uh, Stevie I'm leaving his gig. And I said, Stevie, I got a problem here. Uh, I says, man, I, these guys just came by. And I said, I really can't afford not to do it. My kids are small. My kids were young. And he understood it, and he wanted to buy me some anvil cases for my horns. And he says, when you come, when you finish the tour, come on back. Uh, just give me somebody. And I wound up giving him Randy Brecker replaced me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, so because I knew Randy from years before in New York. So it, it's kind of funny. And that's, that's, that's sometimes what you have to do now. For something that I didn't want to do was one of the greatest learning experiences of my life. Because first of all, I learned about merchandising, marketing, understood about staging, understood how to make things look like it's not staged and how it looks natural when there's all these inside cycles mm -hmm. going down mm -hmm. and inside cues that nobody knows about, which for me was phenomenal. Besides the people you meet and the Andy Warhols and the whole circle of people <laughs> changes, like Truman Capote and... That must have been an amazing 10-week tour. Well, it, it, it was... It was it, it was amazing to the point that pure, decadent rock and roll at its purest form. And remember, this is before people had, had stages, before they had tent semis traveling. These guys are traveling with tent semis before anybody else did. Yeah, well, you lay me I saw you for the first time playing with Stevie Wonder, opening for the Stones at uh, RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And Stevie rocked the house, and then we waited, and then we waited, and then we waited some more. Here comes a little passenger van from the tunnel, bringing the fellas out to second base. This is before the big production, before corporate sponsorship of rock concerts, before the fancy uh, lights and all the bells and whistles and laser light show and explosions and everything else. It was so stripped down, like Beatles, Shea Stadium, yeah. all that old footage. They came out, they played for 35 minutes, got back in the van and left, and we were all happy. Yeah. Now, can you imagine today right. going to see the Stones and they play 35 minutes? No, that's really bad. <laughs> well, you know, the funny, the funny thing is, is that when, when that tour happened, during the 60s, when I, when I was in the 60s, uh, with Butterfield days, and we were doing the Fillmore days, all the light shows going on were by Chipmunk. Now, when I did Woodstock, who was the light guy was Chipmunk. Really? Yeah. Now, when I go with the Stones, who was the lighting guy? Chipmunk. That's right. He was the guy back in he the He was day. the guy. So yeah. now, now this whole contact now that is going down, the people that were, were there were all the stage people and, and the, the gaffers were the people that started Claire Brothers. They started all these big businesses. And, and so what happens is you realize that as life is going on, I always used to think life was like a circle. And what happens is like, you know, you run into these people at different points in your life. It's not like a circle. It's like a spring. And what happens is we all travel around this spring mm -hmm. at different speeds. But when it hooks up again with these people, now instead of being gaffers, they own Claire Brothers. Instead of doing this, they're at different positions. They own the companies. Instead of you being like a little young kid, all of a sudden you're a little more mature and have a little more dimension going down. You know, you understand a little more. Because I I'll never forget with the first Stones concert... And I had done work with Stevie before that and the Stones, and that was one thing. On this the European thing, when they did it, it was a transition that happened because they had hired these bands beforehand to, to walk around the stage and walk around the whole auditoriums beforehand to create this ambience of an evening. Then everything would go dark, and they had these two gas jets on the side of the bandstand. And all of a sudden, you'd hear, ladies and gentlemen, the Rolling Stones again. <laughs> these... 90-foot jets of, of gasoline-empowered thing, and the band would come up from the bottom of the stage on hydraulics. And I said, oh, man, this is kind of cool. You know, no the whole, oh, man, it's, I got chills now because it's, it's unbelievable to this day. They thought it through. Man, uh, uh, you have, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to make you believe. And the, and the great thing about that tour, and this is just like, I'm throwing carrots out from the book because this is all part of it. On that tour, this is decadence. They've, they've, they've lived on private jets and big hotels and floors at Georgia Sank. They decided they wanted to travel through Europe on a private train, not a car, a locomotive and three trains and three cars. 
and not to stay in hotels, but to stay in castles. So, consequently, this whole tour, we stood in castles and traveled with a private train How with three cars, that? with a chef. Every castle you went to had a chef 24 hours. If they went, Even in the United States, when we stood in the United States and stood with Stevie's thing, and we'd stay at the mansion with, with the Playboy Mansion. Out of the Playboy Mansion, you have chefs 24 hours. You get up at 6 in the morning, and you tell the guy, well, you want some filet mignon, you know, Bernays. <laughs> so, you know, a little small little kid, you know. I, would, I went to a house one time with Keith through his house, and I, says, and I go out, and it's like, I don't know, 1,000 acres. And I look it over, and I'm a young kid. I says, oh, man. I'm saying to myself, how many gardeners does this guy have? And I said, man, you know, we have like 30, 40 gardeners. And he starts laughing. He says, gardeners, it's a herd of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't lawn mow it. You, know, you can't cut this stuff. And I started, I said to myself, oh, my, my dimension of life changed a little. Oh, my gosh. So I mean, it changes your perspective some degrees. Well, what's fascinating is that these stories, and like you said, you're just you're expanding on, on uh, some material that you have in the book and expanding on that to give us an inside peek through this podcast of those days and try to give a little taste and feel more than you just can from from a written word obviously but you mentioned albert grossman back in the bearsville records days right. which was uh, woodstock new york uh, a lot of great artists todd came, came through that todd like you mentioned uh, paul butterfield blues band janice uh, joplin members of the rock and roll hall of fame and that you played the original woodstock with uh, david sanborn who Woodstock. was also who's also in the band uh, of that band can you give us a little reflection steve on your woodstock experience well, from that perspective in in in, in that point butterfield blues band yeah at that point i think someone pulls out of the show i don't know if it was jeff beck or somebody somebody pulled out of the show and grossed me because of the people that he had on that show uh, and he loved butterfield he loved the band they had the band play and i lived in woodstock at the time i had a house in woodstock the real woodstock in bethel so in order to get there we had to go to the holiday inn and everything was being staged from the Holiday Inn into the grassy area over there. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can get in was a helicopter. So you get on this helicopter, and the helicopter drops you off next to the stage, and then it goes and pick up somebody else. And we were there for like, I don't know, 30 hours or something like that. So everybody's playing. Hendrix is there. I mean, it's just like when you're around everybody, it makes you realize everybody's the same. There's no difference. Right. No, no difference. Mm -hmm. It's just like you're sitting at somebody's house mm -hmm. and talking. So there's no, the ego is, is non-existent at that point because everybody's high. Everybody's, everybody don't care. <laughs> you're just playing music. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. Right. Remember, the tickets were tickets for the film all during that period. Even the, even the Woodstock thing, I, they were like 2.50 and the concert would start at sure. like 7.30 and end at 4.30 in the morning. Unbelievable. You know, this is, and you know, and Santana would wait outside with his guitar to play and every once in a while, Bill Graham would let him in and listen to a band and every once in a while would put his band on or put his little group on as one of the filler things as they're waiting for another band to come up. You know, the, I forget about it sometimes, but, but the days is gone. It'll never happen. Society is different. Times are different. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, no you know, some people, all, all, a lot of young people worry about, you know, uh, if they're going to get a Grammy, if they're going to get this. Nobody cared about that. All we cared about was playing. We didn't even want to be on AM. We wanted to be FM. Mm. If we went to AM, we got pissed. We, <laughs> we thought we sold out. We're talking with Steve Medeo on this podcast, Reflections in the Key of Life title of his new book steve you're you're not in any one musical genre you bounce from genre to genre you've uh, recorded every kind of music out there from jazz rock blues you name it you've been on so many huge hits with so many big artists i'm talking john lennon i'm talking earth wind and fire of course i'm talking stevie wonder and on and on and on let's talk about your experience with john lennon okay well john wound up getting the call from bobby keys who was with the stones at the time is where i met with the stones who wound up doing walls and bridges with john lennon and we we hung out somewhat in new york i mean he was in new york at the time and i lived in new york so when i went down to the studio actually the day before the recording started i met bobby and he introduced me to john lennon we got to hang out before we did the recording i think we were drinking some beer or wine we were talking and listening to john's songs John started playing the guitar, and as he was playing, I started sort of just plotting out some stuff on a piece of paper. It was easy, and he was easy. John was a pretty peaceful guy. All he wanted to do was to play his music.
So between that, we went from John Lennon, uh, who opened up the things with uh, Harry Nielsen from uh, Bobby Keys, uh-huh. with Nielsen, Nielsen, sure. all that. <laughs> and me and Harry had our arguments together. He said, you're a jazz guy. I said, well, maybe I'm a jazz guy. I don't know. You know? <laughs> I'm a trumpet guy. You know what he was? Everybody is as happy as a man can be. Climb aboard, little walk, sail away with me. You know, and at first, when I first met him, this is the type of person where he says, you know who I am? He says, I'm Harry Nielsen. I said, well, who is Harry Nielsen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's who I was. I, I don't care about who you are. I still don't. I don't know half right. of the people in the world. Right, exactly. People, because sometimes people forget. I, it wasn't until in my 40s that I listened to the records I did, and I was able to sit down. Someone said, well, didn't you listen to this? I said, well, no, I was making records. I didn't, I didn't bother right. listening. I was always ahead of the curve. You kept moving on, right. You kept moving on. You know, my job, my job, I always felt like, like, and I'm being a little facetious about it, but not that much, a glorified waiter. My job is to service the song. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. Now, if out of that I get attention and, and I have a style that comes out, all well and good. But that's not the number one motive. My motive is to service the song for the artist. If I can make the artist cry, which I did sometimes with a Marshall Tucker band one time, and he's listening to it, and he does the song, and he starts crying. We're down in Florida working with uh, Bill Simsek. The Cowboys were tough, the women the same way. Said he was a star back in 31. And Hollywood liked him for some songs that he had done. He's the last of a singing cowboy. Singing songs of desperation and joy, yippee I o Marshall he started crying. He says, man, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. If that's what you want. That's, that's the beautiful. payoff. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the magic money. The money was music, secondary. Man. I made money and everything else. But that's not what it was. Magic of music. Let's touch on uh, Stevie Wonder's superstition. A lot of people might not realize there are only three cats on that track. Yeah. You. Myself, Trevor Lawrence. And Stevie. That's amazing. Playing all the instruments. And Trevor Lawrence uh, wrote uh, So Excited, was a producer with Jimmy Cliff, worked with Richard Perry. Richard Perry worked with Richard Perry on a lot of things on, on Ringo's albums. Mm-hmm. We did all that stuff. That was through John Lennon through Richard Perry. So, I mean, all, the, all those things are so connected over the years. You know, like once once we were talking, me and Fitz were talking in the studio, and he puts on a record and says, oh, yeah, I'm on that. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely day by Bill Withers. Bill Withers. Right, I you're said, on oh, yeah. everything. Uh, but I didn't know, and then all of a sudden I got a reuse check about four days before he played it. I said, oh yeah, I just got a check from them. Just one look at you And I know it's gonna be A love So, so how many how many uh, days out of the month do you smile leaving your mailbox? It depends. Sometimes if no TV shows, if they're on hiatus, nothing. If new TV shows and movies are coming out, sometimes they, they, it's quite nice. And, and you know, like three times a year, different checks come in from all over the world, from mm-hmm. Holland, mm-hmm. the Netherlands. And it's all right. The worst thing that happens to me is that, and I hate to say this, but when I was young, I made a lot of money fast. I made more at 17 than my father was making, working really hard and as a laborer. I mean, I bought a Corvette, and I had an E. Everybody thought I was a drug dealer or something like that, you know? <laughs> but I had fun. That's what I did. I collected cars at one point. And the problem with that is that it's so easy to make money. Uh, all you have to do is work. So when someone said to me one time, they says, oh, man, I wish I was a millionaire. I says, well, it's real easy. They said, you got to be kidding me. I says, no. Work seven days a week, 20 hours a day for seven years. You lead hot dogs, won't have any friends, mm-hmm. won't have any social life, mm-hmm. but at the end of seven years, you'll have a lot of money, if mm-hmm. that's what you want. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I didn't. I spent a lot of money. I had a lot of money, and L- but, live, I, but I'm all right. Life. I'm not going to eat dog food for the rest of my life until I die. Living life. Living life. 
living life to its fullest. More than just the money. More than just the money. You know, I, I was I was very lucky how things uh, turned out. Well, Steve, I'm looking forward to going down this road with you with our podcasts, Reflections in the Key of Life. We have to we have to remember this, Fitz. What we're talking about now, which is a minuscule part of a day of my life. <laughs> This is not even being like, if I'm on tour and every day is like from the minute you get up until if you do sleep, there's always five million things going on. And that's what people who haven't been on the road might not necessarily connect to. People will go to a concert as a, as a fan and go see their favorite act. And then they'll talk about that night for days and they'll wake up the next day to go to work and go, oh man, I'm exhausted. I was like, wow, what a, that was an experience. That just took everything just to, just to be a part of that. Not knowing that the guys and gals that were on that stage left that stage immediately, went on their bus or back to their hotel, 4 a.m. hotel lobby call, jumping on an airplane, and they're doing the exact same thing that exhausted you as the music fan that night. As, as they're, they're doing it the next night and the next night and the next night, and when you're on that roll, you never really have a chance to reflect. No, you never have a chance to reflect. Remember this, you know, and I was young, I was very young when, I, when a lot of this happened, and I'm a big touring, but all during that period, those tours were 28 out of 30 days you had concerts. Now, under the best conditions, so therefore, after the concert, you decompress by going to the dressing room and drinking a little to get, you, get the edge off, going to a party until 3, 4, 5 in the morning. I'd go back to my room, take a shower, get dressed, lay on the bed until the wake-up call. I was already dressed on the top of the bed. Mm -hmm. So when someone called and says, we'll leave it, I said, oh, I'm already ready. I, I was, I've been just trying to nod yeah. off for 20 minutes because that's down. all the sleep you got. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's an unusual life. It's not, it, you, you have to have a special character and personality and constitution be, to be able to do yeah, it. It's, it's, it's a different concept of living. It's, and you, it's have not, to love, you have to love the music that much because well, it's all about the music. Yeah, the, as I the, said, it's either a passion or a curse. Either yeah. way, you can't get rid no. of it. No doubt, exactly. It's not. It's not. It's not. Certainly not for the money. Mm -hmm. And whoever does it for the money, if if your motive and intent is incorrect, you'll never get there. No and doubt, you, you'll, Jason, you'll, you'll bang into walls constantly. Yeah. As I was saying, Steve, it's going to be great going down this uh, this road with you. I'm excited about our podcasts, and we encourage uh, our listeners to uh, join us. You're going to get to know Medeo more as we go down this road, and the stories. I can't tell you. You're in store for a real treat. Yeah, just, if I could just mention one thing. Just think of this as you're listening to these podcasts. Of If, if you remember the uh, Andy Griffith show, walking down the, the road with a fishing pole with Andy and little Opie, that's going to be that's gonna be like me and Fitz on these there podcasts. There you go, baby. Just think of that picture. There you go. <laughs> it'll sort of give you an idea of where my where our minds are at. Just hanging with Medeo is, is so much fun and hearing his boom, stories. Boom, are, boom. He, you can't, you can't duplicate it, and you can't duplicate this guy's personality <laughs> either. Steve Medeo with yours truly, uh, Jimmy Fitz. Join us as we go down the road of uh, these podcasts. We'll see you soon as uh, we continue Reflections in the Key of Life. Thanks, Fitz. Thanks, Fitz.